thing. And the person that I believe, uh, or persons, at, uh, at least one person, but I believe it's probably with more than one, um, are walking around, living their life, their best life, I'm sure. Uh, that's the way the Navy SEAL way is, to make sure that anybody who does anything bad gets awarded or promoted. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to uh, Green Beret Chronicles. Today, I have Matt on the show. He is on a one man's journey to uh, make sure Commander Price's killer um, gets brought to justice. Right? Um, I wasn't aware of this story. Uh, just watching him on the Anti Hero podcast kind of shed light on a lot of things that I personally disagree with. And if you guys uh, remember a couple of I want to say a couple of months back, I put out a video about what I disliked about the Navy SEALs. And I spoke about some specific incidents, right? Uh, the long survivor incident, John Chapman, and the killing of my buddy Logan Melgar, right? All those um, events <clears throat> didn't sit well with me, and they still don't, right? And my fight was mainly with the folks that are on social media nowadays as far as SEALs go, because they're not really stepping up and saying, hey, these events are messed up. And it's not a representation of our community. And I got a lot of blowback from that, but it is what it is, right? Because my, you know, um, stands on my stands, right? And I stand by him. But I wanted to bring uh, Matt on because he's been doing a lot of research on these um, incidents, on these corruptions, right? And I wanted him to speak on those corruptions. So, uh, Matt, if you don't mind, please let the audience know who you are. And then you can jump right into Commander Price, what happened to him, and why you are fueled by making sure his killer is brought to justice. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to once again share some of the stuff that I've learned over the years um, that all started with Commander Price's death. But a little bit about me, just real quick. I am a U.S. Army vet uh, during the Gulf War, 89 to 93. I was an Army Intel guy, active duty. Um, after I got out of, of the military, I became a cop. I was a cop for 30 years. During that period of time, I was also, right after 9-11, uh, became a United States Federal Air Marshal and did that for a little over four years. And uh, so I have a, a pretty wide uh, breadth of, of experience as far as investigations go and ex exposure to different levels in law enforcement, um, you know, SWAT for 10 years almost. And so there's, I've got perspective from multiple different angles. And um, the reason I'm involved in any of this is because Joe Price, Commander Joe Price, who was Commander of SEAL Team 4, was a high school buddy of mine. And in 2012, December 22nd, to be specific, he was found dead in his bunk in uh, Tarancota, Afghanistan. And, you know, when when we first, as a community, as friends, grew up with him and, and re people that respected his career, that was that didn't really sit right with anybody. Um, when we went to the memorial service, people were just taken aback that, you know, Joe would kill himself, which is what the United States Navy said happened. And over time, um, his family began to doubt the validity of that uh, determination. And in 2017 time frame, I was brought in by the family, his wife, his sister and father, um, to use my skills as a as an investigator um, to look at his case based on the evidence that was provided and see if there was anything that I could see that was um, right about it, wrong about it, um, just to give it a, a an unbiased view as a law enforcement investigator. So I did that and they gave me what I call his, his murder book, um, which had all the statements, um, the medical findings, the any lab reports that might've been available, crime scene photos, um, all that kind of stuff, timeline of what was going on at that time uh, in, in country. So I got all that information and um, based on my investigations, and, and the evidence that was presented and the evidence that was missing, I determined that Job did not kill himself. And the reason I believe that is is pretty um, compelling. If you you sit and look at this from a, even if you're not an investigator, just from somebody who would wonder why something would be the way it is. And, and when I lay this out here in a second, you're going to, hopefully the listener will probably go, man, that is definitely fucked up. And uh, so I'll, I'll pretty much lay out the case for Job's murder versus suicide now 
Um, I want to set the stage though that Job, Job was a, a a Boy Scout essentially. He was the um, the good guy, the quintessential good guy. The everybody's friend didn't have favorites, didn't have a clique was accepting everybody in high school. He was that way throughout his life. He was a little bit aloof, a little weird. Um, not necessarily, uh, he was very jovial. Don't get me wrong. He was a, he was a, a guy that liked to, to have a good time and laugh. And But he was a little bit aloof, I guess would be the best word for him. Um, he went, became a Navy SEAL, was a Navy SEAL, moved his way up, became the commander of SEAL Team 4. And before he actually took command of SEAL Team 4, and when they were deploying into Afghanistan, he went early um, to take a, take a look at a uh, an incident that occurred um, in country near where he was going to be, uh, where SEAL Team 4 was going to be, but SEAL Team 2 was currently at. And he was asked to come in and take a look at an, uh, an incident that involved an uh, Afghan detainee who was killed by a Navy SEAL. Um, that Navy SEAL, um, I'll give you his name here in a second. His name was, I want to say Schwartz, but I want to double check my notes to make sure I don't screw that up. Yeah, his name was David Schwartz. He was a member of SEAL Team 2, and he was the, the accused SEAL of uh, killing a detainee. And Job was brought in to kind of be an outside party to look at the, the incident and determine whether or not um, this thing should go towards court, towards the court martial route. Um, as a result of Job's time there, after he left, after that was done, he went and took over SEAL Team 4 in country in May of 2011. Uh, I, I lied, June of 2011 um, is when he became commander of SEAL Team 4. Um, there was chatter amongst the locals in the area that they wanted to get back at the SEALs for the death of one of their, their people. And, you know, as Joe, if you're a commander of a, of a SEAL Team or any unit for that matter, and something like that happens that you weren't a part of, you would want to know if there's any animosity in the region um, and, and whether or not that's something that you need to be aware of and, and keep your, and plan for when you're doing missions, things like that. Well, that, that information as far as um, the, the, the retaliation component that they were talking about, the locals were talking about, but SEAL Team 2 intel had picked up that chatter was never related to Joe. So Joe takes over, SEAL Team 4, um, they, they're in country um, as of September of 2012. And his first SEAL casualty under his command as SEAL Team 4 commander happens November 2nd, 2012, and that's Matt Cantor. Um, and then three weeks later, um, another one of his SEALs dies, Kevin Ebert, Ebert um, November 24th, 2012. So within that period of time when he was um, in, you know, the, the SEAL Team 2 incident happens, and it's only a couple months um, tops. And uh, Job, obviously, as a commander, and I would assume you'd feel the same way if you lost any any guys that, that were under you or even just people you worked with, it would be a, a difficult thing to accept um, and that you would have some, as a commander, you would bear some responsibility um, on that. You know, there's, there's probably a lot, a lot of stress being the commander of a of a an elite combat unit. Um, I I I don't deny that Joe was probably under pressure. Um, however, uh, fast forward now to December twenty second, two thousand twelve. Joe was found dead in his bunk. So between November 29th when the last when Kevin Ebert dies and you know, less than a month later, Joe was found dead in his bunk. And between that period of time, um, some members of, of the high-ranking members of the SEAL community uh, show up in country. So December 7th through the 9th, Captain Smith um, and Admiral Pibus show up. Um, Smith was in charge of all East Coast teams, and Pibus was um, in charge of all SEALs at the time. Um, he was the, the head dog. They show up in country, and they have a meeting with Joe. Um, apparently, that meeting and then the meeting that happened a week later when um, Tim Szymanski who was also one of the top guys in the SEALs at the time, shows up as well. So he and Pibus have another meeting with Job. And apparently there was, it was heated from, from what people said in their statements. It was a rather loud conversation. Um, unknowing at the time what that would be about, we kind of now can, can 
sort of reverse engineer it and kind of see where things were happening that that you know including the the retribution part um that could have caused them to come into country and, and something that would cause a loud argument between um command staff and job um naval uh, special warfare command staff and job the commander of seal team four um on december 17th the day after the Szymanski Pybus meeting, Job was um, complaining of dehydration, was given saline to help recuperate with his body. Um, Szymanski and Pybus lead, had left already by then. Um, and then a few days later, Job was found dead in his bunk. So that's kind of the timeline on, on Job getting into country and, and his death. So his death component to this, and the thing that I was most interested in as an investigator and what I first looked at before I knew any of this other information was just simply the crime scene that I call. And, and you have to remember as an investigator, and, and, and this is for anybody, if there is a dead person where a dead person shouldn't be, it's a crime scene. Whether it was suicide, natural causes, whatever, it's a crime scene until proven not a crime scene. You don't go, it's not a crime scene and create it into a crime scene, it's the reverse. You go to the worst possible thing because that's what you want to assume because you have to preserve evidence and work your way back from that. So it's a crime scene. When Job's found dead um, around 10 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, in the morning of the 22nd of December in 2012, it was a crime scene. The night before, um, according to statements, he had uh, gone to bed late, 11.30ish, um, and the last person to see him alive was the command master chief, and the first person to find him the next morning was also the command master chief. Job was late for a meeting, um, so they went to go find him. They didn't know where he was. They checked a bunch of places, ultimately went back to his, his bunk, his room and, uh, found him dead in his bunk. And this, just to lay it out, it's one of the, it's called a green mile. It's a concrete metal structure that is, uh, typical of that area for those bases. Um, when the command master chief entered the room, he found Job lying in his bunk, uh, his chest had, uh, was not covered. It was, it was naked, but the lower half of his body was in his his uh, sleeping bag. Um, and he was lying on his back with his Sig Sauer P226 uh, unsuppressed nine millimeter on his chest um, at a 45 degree angle in his right hand with his finger still on the trigger. And his face was facing away, was facing towards the wall, which would be to his right, the same um, as what where the gun is. And there was blood everywhere um on the bed and he checked for a pulse and, and didn't find one so job was um in his mind clearly dead um i want to point out that when i saw him laying on his bed first thing that i noticed was that he was still holding his gun which is not typical of a suicide it, it happens there is a there are um, suicide where the weapons remains in the hand but they're they're specific in in the positioning a lot of them uh, on how that can be um how that can happen where someone can shoot themselves and still have the weapon in their hand. Um, secondly, he was in his sleeping bag. So that would, to me, say that he was intending to sleep. And then after speaking to his wife and his sister and his father, I found out that Joe typically, um, and I forgot to mention, he also had a pillow in the crook of his left arm. So his arm was like this. The other hand was like this. And the pillow was between his forearm and his bicep and his left arm. Um, and I found out from his, his family that Job typically slept in the nude most of his life, that he slept on his left side typically, and he typically slept with a pillow in the crook of his arm, and he would sleep with the pillow underneath the back of his hand and between his forearm and his bicep and his left arm. That was his typical sleeping position. And that's kind of how he was found. And so the first thing that, I, that popped in my head was, why would he kill himself when he's sleeping? That was my first inclination was to figure out how, what was the motivation to kill yourself if that is in fact what Joe did and how could he have done that while he was sleeping? So back to the story, um, the command master chief um, goes and gets a couple other command guys from, from the team and they go in and they all agree Joe is dead and they make the call to the uh, NCIS agent who covered their region. Um, NCIS agent comes around 11-ish in the morning. Yeah, apparently he's not on their, their base where they're at. He had to come in 
from, from somewhere else. Um, and he arrives and the command master chief and the NCIS agent go in the room. NCIS agent confirms that he's dead. Um, and typically in law enforcement, once a crime scene is um, accessed by law enforcement and determined to be a crime scene, law enforcement does not relinquish the scene. It's for scene security. They do that, do that to make sure that um, there is no um, question as to integrity of the, the scene, evidence collection, and things of that nature. Um, you, you would log anybody who comes in and out. It's a very secure process so that if it is a crime that you don't have anybody um, saying that there was corruption or contamination or anything like that. So once the NCIS agent um, confirmed that he's dead, they both, the command master chief and the NCIS agent leave and they lock the door. And this is the part when things go off the rails. Um, the NCIS agent hands the key to Job's room back to the command master chief, tells him not to enter the room, not to have anybody else enter the room. And that is now a secure room in his mind. The problem I have with that is every SEAL, every person not that, in, that isn't that NCIS agent who wasn't there when anything happened is a potential suspect. So you don't give access to the evidence, to the crime scene, to the body, to a potential suspect. So the command master chief has the key now to the room. And even though he's told not to go in there, it doesn't mean he listened. Um, and he is a suspect. And the NCIS agent leaves, and NCIS does not return back for another almost eight hours. So between 11 o'clock and 7 o'clock, anything could have happened to that room. Anything could have been brought in, taken out, tampered with, or altered. I don't know that anything was. I just know that that is the, the assumed presumption is that it could have been. NCIS comes back. They work the crime scene, they take photos, they collect evidence, they swab, they do all the stuff, apparently, according to the notes, that they swab his hands for gunshot residue. Um, they determine the the angle of the, the weapon, where it was at on Job's head, and the trajectory of the bullet. So, you know, as I said, Job was laying on his back, right hand on his chest with a service uh, pistol on his chest, the gun suppressed service pistol finger in the trigger, and his head was facing this direction. When in reality, uh, and on this direction is a wall, about 12 inches, uh, maybe between 12 and 18 inches from Job's body. Um, the Job, based on the trajectory of, the, of the, the round, Job was lying on his left side. The elbow was up at a 45 degree angle. The gun was pressed against the temple and the round was fired through his head out the other side, through the pillow, through the corner of the mattress, ripped shit off the ground, hit a desk type thing. And then supposedly, um, crime scene photos show that Job's bunk had pelican boxes all underneath it, except for one corner, which was in the upper right corner. If you're looking at from Job's feet towards his head, it would be on, there was a, an open space in the upper right corner of under his bed. And that's where the bullet was found in a puddle of blood. Um, I'm not sure how that bullet got there. I, I, I would have to have some sort of a recreation, some sort of a computer generated recreation of how the, that could have landed back there because it seems almost improbable that it would have, but it, that's where it was found. But to traject, the trajectory was 100% that it was in a downward 45 degree angle through the head, through the pillow, through the mattress. So that's that's the angle that it would have been at. So I'm not sure how Job ended up like this from this. That that was another big red flag for me. Um, I also want to point out that Job was not a medicine taker. He typically didn't um, take cold medicine, anything like that, because he was pretty much a, a diet workout kind of guy. He pretty much figured that would handle anything. So um, in his room were Valium, um, tramadol, which is a an opiate that is very high powerful uh, for pain relief, and then um, he had some antihistamines for uh, allergies. In his blood, they found uh, Valium and tramadol and the antihistamines, uh, which is very much unlike Job. 
However, if that were prescribed to him, I would understand that maybe there was an issue and that he needed to have that. But the only thing that was actually in his records as prescribed was the the Valium. He was prescribed um, 15, uh, milligram, 15 five milligram tablets of Valium on the 13th of December. Um, again, he wasn't typically a, um, a medicine taker, but according to the medical personnel there, he asked for it for because he was having trouble sleeping. The tramadol was not anywhere on his records. Um, so I, I question where that pill bottle came from. Now, some statements from some guys there, including um, the one uh, Corman said that he wanted it off the record, that he didn't want it, want the tramadol on his record. Um, that's not who Job was. Job was a I dot and T crossing rule following guy. Always was. Uh, it's just who he is. Has been that way since he was little. So I would find it very difficult that he would go and ask somebody to risk their career to keep off um, some medicine that that if it ever came out that that it was prescribed uh, against policy or procedure that they could lose their job or get in trouble and so could Joe. So I don't imagine that to be true. But in his room were these pills, um, which was another red flag for me. Um, and then when I'm reading through Joe's murder book, I'm, I'm looking at all the reports you know, it doesn't give any measurements of how much tramadol or or Valium was found in his blood. It just says it was present. Um, I couldn't find a single ballistic report on the on the weapon or the round. Um, I couldn't find any gunshot residue reports. I couldn't find any DNA reports. In the NCIS notes, they said they collected all that. Another red flag. Where is the evidence if the evidence was collected? Where is the results of that testing? Um, but one of the big things that really stood out to me was um, when you look at the crime scene photos and you look at what isn't present, um, typically in a direct contact type wound close up and the way that firearms work when it's going into a um, enclosed space like a brain, a, a skull, there's going to be gas blowback, which would then include matter from inside um, the brain, the skull, blood would blow back and there would be quite a substantial amount of maybe not like giant spots but a lot of little spots or or chunks of things that would be present on the hand of the firing of the weapon and very much so inside the weapon and on the weapon um the details of that were very sparse as far as in the reporting but in the photo there's probably eight to ten like pin size specks of blood on Joe's hand. Um, not anything that would be remotely close to what would happen if it was a hand next to a head while holding a gun. And the gun had very little visible uh, blood or brain matter or skull fragments or anything on it. I couldn't see any, to be honest with you. While that is a giant red flag, the red flag that really stood out to me was the fact that there was no Photographs of the blood splatter on the wall, which would have been behind Job, behind his elbow of his shooting hand, um, because that's where the blowback would have gone. And like I said, it was about 12 to 18 inches away from Job, so it definitely would have went back to the wall. When I looked for those photos, I asked the family, where, where were those photos? And they said they asked the same thing, and they got a letter from the Navy when they requested that, that information, and it said that the disc that contained those photos was damaged and destroyed, and there was not another copy. So while I have pictures of the wall from different angles, I don't have any close-up pictures of that wall to show me any type of blood splatter. And the pictures I could look at, which were more angled pictures from a distance, they showed no blood on the wall. But it did show the blood where it pulled up in that back corner of Job's bed where it ended up going down to the floor. You can definitely see blood on the wall there where it pulled along his mattress and then dripped down the wall onto the floor. But that's the only blood you could see anywhere um, outside of the blood on Job's head. So all of those things combined were giant red flags for me as far as an investigation. How do you get to suicide when all those pieces don't add up? Um, the biggest piece is, you know, Job slept nude his entire life. He slept on his left side his entire life. He slept with the pillow on his, on his left arm his entire life. I don't know anybody that's ever committed suicide while they slept. And the reason why that blood splatter in the wall is important because if Job didn't commit suicide and somebody killed him, one of the ways they might have done that is get him drugged up and knock him out and then stand behind him and 
get the gun up at the angle, which would have been required to to, re, to make the, the trajectory what it was. And if that blowback went back and hit a person and not the wall, you would see a, a silhouette or a, a blank area of clean wall with some blood splatter uh, on either side of it. And that would show that there was something obstructing the path of the blood to the wall. And that's an important part of an investigation, especially one where you can't determine whether or not it was actually suicide or not. Um, according to the NCIS notes, they had bagged his hands, which is typical to try to preserve evidence um, on his hands, which would have been gunshot residue, DNA, any type of uh, anything under the nails, if there was a struggle, anything like that. That's typically what you do. Um, I have the NCIS report notes that show that the, he was told, the, the command master chief was told by the NCIS agent, who was an officer, um, do not touch the body, do not remove anything, do not uh, tamper with his body in any way. And this was as they're getting prepared to release the body over to the, the corpsman, the medical people there in, in country so that they can prepare him to go back to the States for his autopsy and then obviously his services. Um, the NCIS agent notes said, I don't, I did not believe that he was going to follow my instructions based on his body language and his mannerisms. I believe that he was going to do what I told him not to do, which is to mess with the body. Body gets released, goes back to medical tent, uh, medical building, um, and uh, the command master chief and several others went back there, um, removed the bags on Job's hands, and washed his body from head to toe, removing and destroying any uh, evidence that could possibly have been on his body was now completely gone, um, which may be why um, there were no reports on anything because there actually was no testing done that, and there was no collection done that they were going to make the only collection what was currently on his body when it was supposed to be preserved for the trip home for the autopsy. So not only do we have all of the, the issues with the crime scene itself, then we have the tampering and destruction of, of evidence by the SEALs. And as I said, until it's determined a suicide through investigation, everybody is a, a suspect. So the NCIS agent allowed the suspect to have access to his room for eight hours. He told him not to touch the body after he was released. And then the same people, including, you know, led by the command master chief, destroyed evidence on Joe Price, Joe Price's body. And the, the sad part about all of this is that um, not only was Job the highest ranking person to be killed in theater um, at that time, um, it got no news. There was a, I believe there was a little at the bottom of the screen where it scrolls by, I think there was something then um, on MSNBC or one of those channels. And that was the only coverage it got. And, you know, the question I will always ask um, with anything is if nothing nefarious happened, then why did you destroy evidence and cover it up? There is no need for cover ups if the evidence points to what you want it to point to. If, it's, if it was a suicide, it would have been very clearly a suicide and you wouldn't have had to cover anything up. Now, what, what reasoning were... Like what reason was the Navy giving as far as why, if it was a suicide, why he committed suicide? Well, the Navy didn't give any reason. They they basically just said it was a suicide. And if you look at the statements, which were taken um, quite a bit of time, you know, typically you want to get those statements as it's fresh in people's memory. But it was 24 to 48 hours later that statements were taken. And the longer it takes for statements to be taken, especially in a unit like a SEAL unit, the more opportunity there is for collusion for people to get their story straight. And if you read the statements, they're pretty much cut and paste. There are some personal interjections in there, but for the most part, the, the, the narrative that was out there was that he was withdrawn, um, destroyed over the loss of his guys, was not eating right and not sleeping, not working out, letting himself go, very uh, not interested in the mission. And that's kind of what, what the statement said. Now, I know for a fact that, you know, a little bit before um, all of this happened to Job, he had, he had had a conversation with his wife via message, uh, email, that he was concerned about some things that were happening. 
and that he was going when he got back, he was going to have to um, handle it as far as you know reporting some people for some things that he he had found. And you know when you think about um, what that could have been, you know there are there's a lot of things that you know we, I talked about the retribution part from CLT two and how it's they were pretty. It wasn't far between far apart between things like sixty miles different between where um, the detainee was from and where Job's unit was, and I wouldn't wouldn't put it past anybody to have set up ambushes, which is what happened with Cantor and Ebert. They were both killed in ambushes. Um, that that would potentially be tied to the retribution component from what happened to that detainee with SEAL Team Two. Um, you know, one of the other things that that Job was dealing with was one of the warlords in the area was was also a drug dealer and Job was forced to um participate not participate in a drug but deal with this guy on a command level um to get things done as far as what their their mission objectives were he had a major problem with that um there was an underage afghani person that some people say was a boy some people say it was a girl it was very difficult to nail down the sex of the the afghani the underage afghani but um Joe believes one of his or multiple of his guys was sexually assaulted and killed um, that underage Afghani. Um, and then finally, um, and we're going to talk about this with Melgar as well, but the ASOT money, um, you know, that, that was a thing. You know, they were getting this money in order to um, use it for mission purposes. Um, and, and Joe caught a couple of his guys misusing yeah, tens of thousands. This wasn't like a grand here and a grand there. This was, you know, thirty to fifty thousand dollars was missing, and the the one guy specifically wasn't, and I, I can't say his name, um, wasn't able to answer for where that money went. Um, and I believe, and this is just me interjecting, that there was drugs being um, purchased with that money, and then either sold in the community out there, or I, I personally believe um, shipped back to the United States. Um, that, that's my gut reaction. That's what I believe probably happened. But all those things, I mean, it wasn't one thing that Job uncovered. There was multiple things that happened. And knowing Job, he's probably going to blow the whistle. Now, do you think the conversation that took place between the folks that traveled into country had anything to do with what he discovered or yes. do you think it was just a one-off I, I think you know because if Job and, and I was told this as well from another source that um Tim Samansky who is you know he is the central figure over the last 20 years within the Navy SEALs when it comes to any of the, cor the corrupt acts or questionable incidents um his his handprint was on all of them starting at robert bridge when he was the uh operations officer that planned that mission in 2002 to all the way through job through uh extortion through like he was involved other crew he retired i want to say in 21 or 22 maybe as the number two at jsoc um, so he was a central figure who had, at, in, at any given time throughout his the last 20 years was in command or in, in a position of influence within the SEAL community for all that time. Um, I, when he came into country, you know, it was Pivas and Smith first who came, and then Samansky came, and there was two different meetings, the one with Smith and Pivas and Job, and then another one between Pivas and Samansky. Um, I believe they were... Uh, ordering him to stand down with anything he might have uncovered. Um, and because it was heated, it was probably Job telling them he's not going to do that because that's kind of guy Job was. He was a, like I said, he was the white knight. He was the good guy. He wore the white hat. Um, he was just a really, really solid human being who had great moral integrity. And I, I can't imagine him ever allowing anything like that to go unchecked. Um, and then a week later, he's dead. Less than a week later, he's dead. Um, Job's wife, Stephanie, um, when he had said to her that something was going on and he was going to have to deal with it when he got back, um, I was told that she had communicated with 
Szymanski's wife, who she was friends with. And that was before Szymanski shows up in country. Um, too many pieces connecting to have them not be connecting. And, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, what I believe is what happened as far as the pre job dying. Now, the crime scene is the crime scene. There's nothing theoretical about any of that. That's all very, um, I, I challenge anybody in law enforcement or anything else to ever, ever challenge my assessment of, of what happened to Job on the day, on the night, morning of that he died. And I want to point out one other thing. I mentioned it as the Green Mile. And you've been in those types of buildings before. Right. You've been yes, in them. Yes. Yeah. I mean, those, 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 those buildings, man, you can hear, like, you can hear the other dude beating off or fucking <laughs> snoring. You can hear everything. Yeah. It's an echo chamber. It's like, it's like being in a warehouse building that's very small. And it's just that, that type of concrete echoey chamber, metal, metal bouncing off of concrete. Um, one of the things I noticed in the statements is that no one definitively heard a gunshot. Um, these are high speed, highly trained combat veterans who are always at threat level red, even when they're sleeping. And you would know, and, and I'm sure you would attest that if you heard a gunshot in the Green Mile, you would know it would wake you up and would make you go straight into what the fuck's happening mode and, and getting your shit straight. You wouldn't be, I think I might have heard it. I was, I was sleeping pretty good or I think I might have heard something. It, if a gunshot went off in that that type of building, you would know. And no one heard a gunshot. One person said somewhere around the 5, 5.30 in the morning time frame, he heard what he thought was a pallet being dropped because they were near the, the mess hall. And that's what he thought it was, and that he smelled sulfur. Um, I would argue, and, 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 and the reason I would argue this is because when I got his autopsy photos, the entry wound area to Job's head on the right temple had a perfectly round half circle. So half of a circle, the other half would have been this. This half of the circle was on one side of his head, on this side of his head, near his ear. And when measured, it is the, if you match the, the, the other side to it, it was the same circumference as a suppressor um and it looks like that was you know if you push hard on skin um especially and then have a concussion with the, the, the gases and, and the round firing off there's going to be bruising and i believe that the, the pressure was placed harder on that side of of the suppressor and created the bruising on job's head and job's weapon was not a suppressed uh capable nine millimeter SIG. It didn't have threaded barrel, didn't have the capability of having a suppressor on it. So to me, the lack of blood evidence and, and brain matter on Job's gun and the lack of blood evidence and and brain matter on Job's hand and also no photos on the wall for the blood splatter leads me to believe that a different firearm uh, was used to kill Job, one that had a suppressor on it. And it wasn't until I saw those photos that it all sort of came really clear to me. Um, and that sound that the the seal in his statement said he heard that the clap or a, a slapping sound of something dropping is more similar to a suppressed round sound, which is more of a clapping sound when it goes off. A little little report, but not nearly the report of an unsuppressed weapon, which is undeniably what it is. Um, and the smell of sulfur would obviously be... Um, smell that happens after you, you fire a, a weapon. Um, so for me, I believe Job was murdered. Um, I believe he was murdered with someone else's firearm, which was suppressed. And I don't have ballistics on his firearm, and I don't have ballistics on the bullet that they found. But I'm, I would venture to bet that that round uh, that they found was fired out of Job's gun. I just don't believe it was fired into Job's head. Um, if I were going to stage a crime scene, I would certainly have a round um, that matched the the barrel of the gun. Um, maybe they aren't that smart. Maybe that round matches a different gun and doesn't show Job's, Job, Job's gun um, being the source of it. But I don't have that report. I've fully requested everything. I'm still waiting. Haven't heard anything back. We'll see. 
So now, who do you think is responsible? Do you think it was one of those things where they hired the man under his command to essentially kill him and make it look like a suicide? And if that's the case, like, how do you prove that? Like, what's the next step? Like, what would be ideal for you? Because uh, from speaking with you, this is something that you're not going to let up on, right? So how would that yeah. all develop? I believe it was a, a third party, someone else on the base. I think the suppressor component to this um, is very, very, in a, a very important part. Um, I know a lot of the, the operator's weapons are suppressed, if not all. Um, and I believe that it was one of his guys. I have a theory on who it is. I can't say his name because I don't have enough evidence yet um, to, to say his name out loud. Um, but I do believe it was one of his guys. And I do believe that it was um, coordinated from the top to do that. And um, because there's there's a preservation component to this. There's a, you know, the, you had the cover up. I believe the cover up was, you know, everything that they did with the crime scene and to his body afterwards. Um, and with the, the suppressor. Um, but I think this has been, you're gonna remember just 2012, so we're 10 years into the war already. And we're gonna go back and talk about some stuff that happened prior to, to this. Um, but there was other questionable things that had happened over the last 10 years. And during that period of time, the brand of the Navy SEALs was becoming um, everywhere. You know, that was a huge thing. You, know, you already had, Luttrell, you already had Chris Kyle, you already had um, Rob O'Neill, like all these things were, were Captain Phillips, like all these things had happened before Job died. And the brand was strong. It was really gaining traction. And keeping the brand intact was the number one priority, I believe. And Job was just a, um, a victim of that. And their ability to cover up exists because they have the cover of greatness sitting around in movies and TV and, and books. And even though that's mostly fictitious, um, the American public doesn't know that. And at least they didn't at the time. And hopefully that's what we're doing here is educating some people about um, greed and power and corruption that is permeating through the Navy SEALs. But for me, you know, once I got into Job's investigation and I started trying to figure out how I could get um, his case reopened, and I realized that that was an impenetrable object. I couldn't get an audience from anybody. And one of the sad parts about this is Job's wife, who was very much involved in helping me um, get information, all of a sudden pulled back and stopped. And you know the way it works in the military is if you have a, a death, if, if a soldier or a sailor, a sailor dies, um, the only person that really has any power to, to do anything is the spouse, the surviving spouse. The, the father or the sister do not. And once she pulled back, my access to information, um, direct information from the Navy went belly up. Um, so I began to work with my sources who then opened up more sources to me, which opened up more investigations into more different things, which we're gonna talk about. Um, and now I believe that the only way I'm gonna get through to anybody is to go after the brand. And the brand is the Rob O'Neill's, the Marks Luttrell's, the Chris Kyle, the Jocko Willings, the, the, the faces of the brand. And um, I'm hoping by exposing those, someone will listen to me about Joe. So why do you think the wife pulled back? Uh, well, she got some money from the foundation, um, from... None other than Mike Hayes, who was a commander of SEAL Team 2 um, during the, that whole debacle with the, the, the killing of the detainee. At the time, he had um, been forced out of the Navy, um, told to resign, um, to retire. And uh, and he went to work for the foundation. And um, $450,000, I believe, was the number that was paid to Job's wife. Um, you know, Job didn't get his life insurance because his life insurance policy um, says suicide. It, it hadn't. He hadn't had it long enough. I think he needed to have it a year before. Um, if he had committed suicide, it wouldn't have changed the outcome. Um, but he didn't have it a year, and uh, so he didn't get. The, they didn't get to pay out on that, and he didn't get his pension. He was six months away from reaching his twenty years, and uh, 
did not get his pension. So one could argue that the foundation stepped up and paid staff for four hundred fifty thousand dollars to as a um, in lieu of those two things. I don't know. I just know after that happened, um, her interest in this waned, and I was actually told by her to uh, stop because I was kicking too many doors and tires. And I was pissing a lot of people off that were then impacting her life there in Virginia. And uh, I think she really enjoyed, as I can imagine most women would who were in that position, being the wife of a commander and having that network. And luckily for her, um, the Navy SEALs are really good at ingratiating the surviving spouses so they don't ask questions. And she still has that same network and that same level of respect in the community that she had when Joe was alive. And uh, sadly, she's just not asking or fighting anymore for the answers. It just blows my mind, man, because this is a 05, a lieutenant colonel in the Navy, six months away from retiring, has a spouse, has a child, and all these evidence that you, not even part of NCIS, was able to uncover, you know, points to foul play yet it's not being entertained uh now as far as the individual that that you think did this are they being held accountable at least or based on your research or are they just out and about just living their lives while uh commander price is dead well nobody was held accountable for anything i mean the, the ncis agent should be held accountable for not securing a crime scene and leaving it um, but they'll be tampered with for eight hours. He needs to be held accountable for the lack of evidence that was collected on scene and, and analyzed and produced as evidence. He should be um, held accountable for his basic ineptitude. And SEALs who disobeyed a direct order from an officer, an NCIS officer, um, and tampered with evidence should have been held accountable. But nobody was held accountable for anything. Nobody was charged, punished. Um, slap on the wrist, nothing for anything. And the person that I believe uh, were persons, at, uh, at least one person, but I believe this probably was more than one, um, are walking around, living their life, their best life, I'm sure. Because uh, that's the way the Navy SEAL way is to make sure that anybody who does anything bad gets awarded or promoted. It's kind of their, uh, their MO to cover things up. So if you got an award or promoted, and you know, we you, you were in the beginning talked about the whole John Chapman thing. And I went a deep dive into that in, in, the, in Brent's, uh, in the, the anti-hero podcast with Brent Tucker and Tyler. Um, well, Slavinsky was promoted. Slavinsky got the Medal of Honor. He stole valor from John Chapman. You know, SEAL teams blocked John Chapman's uh, Medal of Honor package. They put out a propaganda video saying that it wasn't John Chapman who woke up and started fighting again. It was two Chechen or, or whoever they were, Al Qaeda fighters, shooting at each other. Um, that's what we're seeing on the the drone footage. So I mean, they they did everything they could to try to discredit John Chapman until they ultimately just allowed him to get his. They stopped blocking, allowed him to get his Medal of Honor, but they never admitted to doing anything. They just allowed the award to happen, and then everybody just sort of moves on. And there's no accountability. There's no punishment. There's no reprimands. There's no nothing. There's no public apology. It's just a word, promote, move on. Now, um, before we wrap this segment on and move to something else, what else do you want people to know about the case for Commander Price? Like what um, additional details do you have um, or what uh, do the American people need to know uh, before we wrap this up? Every person, and we're going to talk about Mel Garrier in a little bit, um, every person who serves this country deserves to have the respect, honor, and dignity bestowed upon them for the work that they did while serving. I don't believe Job got his. I don't believe Job was given even a modicum of attention and, and respect for what he did. Um, he's considered a quitter. He's considered a pariah because he killed himself, according to the Navy. And I think that's... An, abomination and as americans we need to if we haven't learned anything over the last you know five six seven years is that we need to start questioning everything everything and people should be writing their congressmen and asking for judge case to be reopened people should be if you were in the military 
you should be embarrassed that your military, because I know I am, and I know you are, is a, is allowed to operate under these types of conditions. And if you are a SEAL who has uh, witnessed corruption, you need to come forward and speak. Um, Job Price was the very best of what you say you stand for. And he's gotten the very worst from his from our government and the Navy. And it's it's a travesty of justice. Yeah, I agree 100 percent man. I agree 100 uh, percent But Matt, I appreciate you coming on and talking about Commander Price. Again, we have several other topics to discuss. If anyone wants to reach out to you and lend a uh, hand of support, uh, where can they find you? Um, I have an old website that still has good information on it, but uh, mattkubler.com, M-A-T-T-C-U-B-B-L-E-R.com, or you can email me at matt at mattkubler.com. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on, Matt. Appreciate you. It's been an honor.